Two best friends planning to take the wrestling world by storm. Or wait, were they brothers? Anyways, in the process creating a tag team that became a household name during the Attitude Era, with droves of loyal supporters. Not them, let me finish. Their passion started them in backyard wrestling, later working for a local indie promotions for over a decade, until they got their big break. And when their big break was ultimately a big letdown, they created a company of their own, blazing their own trail, working to create a promotion for the way that they see wrestling to take care of the boys and girls working for them, making sure that they're well paid. No, not them either. Okay, okay, think face paint, face paint. They were literal tough guys who loved this business. They've been working since the 80s. They're known by an iconic name of just three letters. Say it with me now. Not even close. I'm Michael. Let's get you smartened up on the insane clown posse. Welcome to Suplex. Before you click away, just take one second. I was just like you. I saw the Insane Clown Posse and I wrote them off as just not for me. That was until my producer mentioned they might be misunderstood in the wrestling community. Now, as you probably can tell by the fact that I'm sitting in a lit studio in front of a green screen, this is about the Insane Clown Posse and I might agree with him that they might have been mistreated in the wrestling business. Now, I've never owned a Hatchet Man necklace or Whoop Whoop, but let's give them a fair shake. 1983, a young, and I do mean young, Shaggy 2 Dope and Violent J started backyard wrestling at the ages of 9 and 11, respectively. They started tagging together years later as they got more experienced with wrestling. As the 80s rap, two things happened in the young men's lives. One, they started a little known rap group known as the Insane Clown Posse. That's right, before they even picked up a microphone, they were taking bumps and the two had big wrestling dreams. Number two, they even got trained. Their trainer was none other than Australia's greatest professional wrestler, Al Costello. That's right, the original man of a thousand holds was the trainer of the Insane Clown Posse. And if being the original man of a thousand holds isn't cool enough, he was also on a tag team known as the Fabulous Kangaroos. If you wanna know more about Al, let us know in the comments. The duo's first foray into the indie scene was a show that featured Bobo Brazil and the original Sheik in the main event. And the two were fascinated by a VHS called Outrageously Violent Wrestling from Japan. VHS, tape, VHS are like tapes. Tapes are how we would watch movies back in the day and movies are like long YouTube videos. Anyways, the duo loved the video so much they made a compilation of their favorite matches and re-recorded alternate commentary over them, Mystery Science Theater 3000 style. They even made up gimmick names for their commentary personas. These two just recorded it and sold it. I think we've all tried our best Tony Schiavone or Michael Cole impressions watching wrestling. The sales of VHS were so popular, the two decided to have their own wrestling show, Strangle Mania Live. The show featured many hardcore and deathmatch legends. ICP even had stories written in the program to talk about each of the matches, giving new fans something they could, launch, something they could latch onto and be invested in the show. They wrote backstories on characters just like you did with your buddies when you were 12 with your figure fed. Or like I did when I was 16 and 15, 25 and 32. Anyways, 1997 was just what ICP needed after a rough couple of years in their music career. I don't want to talk about their music career too long because that's not the purpose of the channel. But before 1997, these two were signed to a Disney-owned record label who dropped them the day of a record store sign. The records that they were signing that day were number 63 on the Billboard Hot 100. It's like getting a FedEx pink slip on your wedding day then. But as I was saying, 1997 was a great year for ICP and another legendary abbreviation in the world of wrestling called out to see if they'd be interested in coming in for a show. That abbreviation was the one, the only, RVD Rob Van Dam. Apparently RVD had been sending ICP tapes of ECW since the three of them became friends. In 1997, RVD and Sabu, the son of the original Sheik from their, the two's first indie show, were the biggest heels that ECW had to offer. Heels are bad guys. At the second ECW pay-per-view Hardcore Homecoming, ICP took the stage and started performing songs for their upcoming nationwide tour. ICP was attacked by RVD and Sabu only to have the Sandman come and make the save kendo stick in hand. Unfortunately for the Sandman, he would be stretched out for his troubles. 
All this took place before ICP took off on a nationwide tour, just two days before they were supposed to get on the bus. I just love the fact that these two made it in music so big that they got to be on a world tour and they just went back to wrestling two days before because that's what they truly love to do. These dudes literally rule. In 1998, another promotion contacted ICP, this time not for wrestling, but for music. The hit make kid himself, Jim Johnston from the WWF reached out to ICP to see if he'd make them a new theme for the stables, for the company's new stable, The Oddity. The Oddities had a lot of talent, whether it was Luna or Earthquake, also known as John Tenta, ICP was later slated to perform the theme song live at an upcoming show. The two dreamed of being wrestlers, and here they were, working for the WWF in the late 90s. Wrestling was at its peak. Oh, did I mention the show was going to be at Madison freaking Gardens? You know, the spiritual home of the WWF? We're talking bucket list level stuff here. Oh yeah, remember that deathmatch compilation the two put together a few years? ago well it was basically old mick foley matches that's right cactus jack mick foley mankind dude love whatever you want to call him they cut him a freaking check for a vhs they made in the 90s these guys essentially created a mashup of their favorite matches made money off it and still took care of the performers of the videos they were using absolutely bonkers could you imagine matthew from bocce mania sending sin cara a check with a little note that says oi thanks for the flat quid governor Duo stated in an interview they asked for a place to get ready for at the Madison Square Garden show. And they were given a locker room to share with none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin and the dead man himself, The Undertaker. They later on went to say they felt so privileged to get to share a locker room with the two legends. Listening to them put their match together that night was one of the best feelings they ever had. I don't think the feeling was mutual because the Texas Rattlesnake literally brought a shovel to the ring to metaphorically bury the ICP later that year. Since the ICP didn't have contracts while wrestling with the WWF, they are wrestling for free. They never took one dime that could have gone to a full-time wrestler. They only had one request in return. What could two insane clowns want in return for wrestling? Ad spots. They wanted ad spots. ICP requested WWF run at least two commercials on a show. A short-lived but hard-hitting feud with the Headbangers and their stint in WWF was over. Kind of heartbreaking that ICP were instructed to act as though as they didn't know how to wrestle despite working in the business for almost a decade and a half. They had done it. ICP made it to the WWF, performed at Madison Square Gardens, wrestling bucket list complete. Guess it's time to focus on the music now. Nope, the Monday Night Wars were in full effect and WCW came a calling for ICP services. It wasn't long after ICP joined the WCW gang that they were put into another stable, this time with Raven and Vampiro. They called themselves the Deadpool. The Deadpool didn't last long though, and ICP soon started a second stable called the Dark Carnival. Another cool name, two for two. ICP traded out Raven for the Great Muda and the Kiss Demon, which as a kid, I thought Gene Simmons was a wrestler, which I mean like that's neat, but ultimately it was Dale Torborg, a journeyman wrestler. But while in WCW, ICP tore it up with the likes of Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie was actually very complimentary of them. He knew how much they loved and respected the business, and he appreciated that. A big trio's win against the Tank Abbott-led boy band three count. The 90s were weird and fun. One scary, awesome bomb off the top of a school bus, which led to a terrible injury for Shaggy, and the two were out of the promotion. The two had done it all. Over 14 years in the wrestling business, it was time for them to hang up their boots. Or that's what would have happened with any normal clown posse. But these boys were insane. They would go on to wrestle until this very day. They wrestled in ROH, TNA, and various indies throughout the world. These guys were the biggest fans of the business and always kept that passion for the art of wrestling alive. Even though being treated as an oddity at the literal highest level. Each time they made it to the show, they were seen as an outcast or weird. I'm ashamed to admit, I saw them the same way when I was younger. These are two great stewards of the wrestling business, and I want to apologize to them. Shaggy 2 Dope and Violent J, I'm sorry. You all worked your asses off to get those spots in WWF and WCW. You weren't some reality TV star or some YouTuber looking to sell and injury dreams. With no irony, I say this. Thank you, ICP, for your love of this business. You were looked down upon and counted out by most of the wrestling industry, except yourselves. And you said, screw you, we'll do it on our own. And that's an attitude that can only be described as very Detroit. That, I say, 
Whoop, whoop. Thank you all so much for watching. It means the absolute world to me. And welcome to Suplex.